My dad is a man for whom a year is marked by the passing of the American sports seasons. Summer is, of course, baseball season. So when I was young, my dad would take me to a Colorado Rockies game in downtown Denver, and we'd make our way to our seats, and once the game began, he'd hand me a clipboard, a mechanical pencil, and a paper scorecard, and I'd help him score the baseball game. Baseball scoring is a dying art, but it has its roots in the cricket scorecards that you lot, the British, invented. A scorecard's double-sided, with one team on each side, with the innings across the top and the players in batting order down the side, and using a set of cryptic abbreviations and notations, you notate each play as it happens in the game. There are some general conventions, but no single set of notations, and these are often adapted by scorers in idiosyncratic ways, and then these idiosyncrasies are passed from one generation to another like from father to daughter. And so I'd sit by my dad, watching and scoring the game, sometimes asking him for help, and we'd slowly fill out the scorecard together. When the game was ended and the scorecard was filled, my dad and I didn't go home and analyze the data we gathered in order to derive deeper insight about the players. Instead, my dad put the scorecard in his filing cabinet to keep as a souvenir. Sometimes he'd even put the weather for the game on top of the scorecard, and when I was young, I'd joke that in the winter, he could keep himself warm by rereading his collection of scorecards and imagining himself in the sun. Now, while I've painted a picture of an idyllic father-daughter scene, to be honest, I often found baseball games long and boring, often being much more interested in visiting the souvenir shop or buying candy, or following boys around the stadium concourse. But still, for some reason, the physical act of scoring a baseball game stuck with me. And this often literally left field experience greatly influenced my creative practice, probably because it was the first time I gathered and visualized data. Looking back, I scored a game for the same reason every other scorer does to stay in the moment, to be present, to be less distracted, to get in the game, and to make a souvenir of the game you can always refer back to through freezing and preserving it in between two sides of paper, like insects fossilized in amber. These early experiences with my father convinced me there's a power in the process and experience of data gathering, and that data gathering can offer benefits more focused on the well-being of the data collector instead of statistical insight. As I got older, these baseball games became a thing of the past, as at 22, I moved to the UK for an MA in communication design. And on my MA, my early experiences with baseball scoring manifested themselves in a project I called Writing Without Words where I gathered data from On the Road by Jack Kerouac, and then explored ways of visualizing this data to highlight the hidden, the hidden patterns and structure of a text. Here, my experience of the baseball scorecard also compelled me to gather data from the text in the same engaged manner by hand, using the process to get closer to a book I loved as a teenager. Then, once I visualized the data, I again felt that satisfaction of being able to press a large amount of information, an entire novel, onto a single side of paper. This was the first data project I'd ever created, and it reawakened my interest in this analog process of looking, collecting, and notating. And so I began to create design work where this type of manual notation was an integral part of the design process, where statistical insight took a back seat to the experience of engaging with data, where the end design functioned both as a souvenir of the process and also aimed to communicate messages beyond the insights locked within the data. And these messages are often more subjective and driven by emotion. This different way of working with data can be seen in my piece at the Olympic Park in East London from last year, made using data that school children had collected from the park, not for statistical insight, but instead to inform the design of a new data-driven park landscape. 
And another example can be seen in a collection of a thousand small drawings that visualize data from the thousand most frequently used English words, visualized not to draw statistical insight, but instead to highlight the beautiful variation in the English language and displayed at the British Council Pavilion at a book fair in Mexico. So as you can see, instead of communicating with traditional design materials, I choose to communicate with data, often data gathered in a manual, analog, laborious way. As for data visualization, I see it as a design process that I use to work with this material, a process that as we move into the future will be as common a method for a designer to create and communicate with as much as the golden mean, color theory, design systems, and all of the other tools and rules of thumb that designers use daily. And seeing data visualization as a design process challenged me to extend the visual languages that designers use to work with data, exploring ways of presenting data that, besides being legible, are more memorable and more expressive to a layperson audience who might just be learning about data for the first time. So this could mean making data danceable, like this project I created as the first data artist in residence at Facebook, where I converted a month of a couple's interactions on Facebook timelines into dance steps, bringing their digital dance across timelines into a physical space. Or it could mean making data hoppable, like my open data playground for the South Bank Center in London where hopscotches were created from open data sets in order to communicate how open data is online for anyone to play with and interpret however they choose, even if some of those interpretations are less conventional than others. Or it could mean making data that's touchable and wearable, like this commission with Miriam Quick, where we explored physical ways of communicating air quality data from Sheffield in a hopefully memorable way for a citizen audience potentially uninterested in air quality. One part of the project presented weeks of particulate matter data as something you could touch and wear, and then the other part communicated days of pollution levels in Sheffield through glasses that would make your vision more or less hazy depending on the data. Okay, as you can see, these projects aren't your typical bar chart. And early in my career, I'd give talks about my work, and people would ask me, what's, what's the key insight? What's the key truth revealed through presenting this data? As though they were scientific visualizations or pieces of data journalism. And I couldn't really answer. And this is when I realized I was working with data in a different way, with a different process, and a different endpoint. And since my work with data didn't always arrive at a grand statistical conclusion, it seemed that for many people my work wasn't valuable or it wasn't useful. But I still felt there was value in this analog, laborious, often physical way of grappling with data. This process helped me stay in the game and be closer to my work. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm an American immigrant turned British citizen over time beginning to better understand the nuances of British culture, and at some point I stumbled upon a slang term that piqued my interest. The slang term anorak, now one of my favorite words. And after research online, I can define an anorak as a person who is interested in the collection of minuscule, arcane, and quite often useless bits of information. And the term comes from the type of coat stereotypically worn by train spotters as they gather their data on the train platforms, similar to the chat that you see on screen. And after looking at an anorak's usual output, lots of handmade notations, jottings, and tallies, like in these notebooks from a, a train spotter and a bird spotter on the left, and then looking at the output of my design process on the right, Okay, it was then that I realized that I too was a card-carrying anorak, due to how I found more value in the data collection process and the end statistical insight. But as you can see in this film, the term anorak is considered derogatory and negative in the UK, and baseball scorecards are often considered one for the geeks. It seemed to be nerdy, uncool, and antisocial to be collecting data on the things you're passionate about, though I disagree. 
data collecting doesn't have to offer scientific conclusions to be meaningful, as the experience of data gathering can be where the meaning is found. And experience is the right word. Data gathering has been part of our human experience for tens of thousands of years. Early human writing systems weren't first used to record poetry, mythology, or history, but were used from the beginning to record data, to record accounts. And really, we're all secret anoraks. We're all acting like data magpies, collecting useless numbers and storing them away as we move about our day. I mean, many of us in this room will know our precise weight, watching every creep of the number up and down the scale, or we might, work, we might mark places we visited on a wall map at home, or know the precise calorie count of our favorite biscuits. Really, many of the numbers we collect could be considered as meaningless and as useless as the data that an anorak collects. But this isn't useless as the basic act of collecting data on a topic, any topic, means it's important to the author and brings the author closer to something they care about. Looking at the data that you gather as a secret anorak is a way of figuring out what's important to you. And, you know, we would never chastise a new parent for their collection of the often useless data traditionally gathered in a baby book. Or, talk badly of a family that carefully collected the heights of its family members. These numbers are cherished and held on to through the years. So as you can see, many people gather data to keep score, to stay in the game, and to get closer to things that matter to them. And I see this gathering of small data as valuable, and I consider it another form of making where someone might use this approach to make sense, to understand what they love more closely, or to make a connection, to be more present and aware, or to make a souvenir or memory, to create a record of the very human performance of just living and of get, getting by, where this physical way of making through noting and marking can offer the same well-being and pleasure as other acts of creation. And for me, I've chosen to use this form of making as a critical part of my design practice. When we look at data from this viewpoint, we can see a view of data quite different to the often cold and computerized perception of big data, where data can now be seen as warm and part of the human story. And data gathering is an act that can often be joyful, emotional, memorable, and meaningful. And this viewpoint what opens up what's possible using data. Now, a data set can be presented with a focus on its lateral truths, revealing a collector or visualizer's emotions, wants, needs, personality, and so on. And artists can respond to a data set in the same way they can respond to an event, an era, or something in the culture around us. And anoraks can gather data for the experience and enjoyment of using this process to get closer to something they love. And I'm excited about how the same data set can now be a scientific and analytical material and a cultural artifact and the souvenir of an experience, eliciting completely different responses in these different spaces. And all of these responses are valid and valuable. But really, there's a similarity between these two camps with data scientists on one side and the anoraks and artists or designers on the other. While they both might work with data in different ways, they're both looking for truth and understanding either of their subject or themselves, except for they're using that truth to different ends. Now, these anorak tendencies of mine recently culminated in a project that I undertook with Georgia Lupi, an information designer based in New York. We realized we both work with data using hand-drawn, anorak-esque approaches, and so we decided to collaborate on a data and drawing project together. As we lived on different continents, we took this constraint as our biggest asset, and we came up with a project we called Dear Data, a year of sending each other hand-drawn data postcards back and forth across the Atlantic. 
Starting on the 1st of September 2014 and lasting a year, every week we gather data around a shared topic in order to investigate aspects of ourselves and our days to then share with the other person. And then, at the end of the week, we'd spend time analyzing that data. And then we would painstakingly draw our visualizations and their annotations on a postcard. And once we were finished, we would drop the postcard in our mailbox or postbox and wait with our fingers crossed. And if all went well, the postcard would arrive at the other person's address. And we'd sit down with the postcard and live the other's life through reading their week, compressed between two sides of paper. So a few examples from the year include a week of capturing every time we said a rude word, or a week of trying to capture our laughter, an almost impossible pursuit, or we gather data about our bad habits, like a week of our envy, and we'd also survey parts of our lives for the other, like in this week of our book collections. We mainly explored themes requiring manual data collection, where, like in baseball scoring, the main pursuit was to use data capture to make sense for ourselves and be present, and also to create a souvenir to send to the other person. Halfway through the year, we made the project public, and the amazing response we received made us realize that our Anorak approach resonated with a wider audience, where people would describe dear data using words that are normally not associated with data, and where data is being described as something warm instead of something cold. And we also received emails from people starting Dear Data correspondence projects of their own, or who are using it as part of their teaching materials for all ages, from primary school to university and beyond, to help students learn to collect and present data. We've been excited about how our personal project became a community project, a community of anoraks. And this is something that we're looking to expand upon. As mentioned, Dear Data originally started as a side project, but then was published as a book both in the US and in the UK. And finally, our original postcards and our preliminary sketchbooks were acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This acquisition convinced us of the value of our analog design approach. And I believe the project's success is due to how it speaks to the latent anorak tendencies we all have within us. Finally, through Dear Data, being an anorak has hopefully moved from something negative to something positive. As Paola Antonelli, MoMA's senior design curator, states when describing the project, she says, this engaged conversation describes the future of our relationship with information. And engaged conversation is the right phrase, where Georgia and I were able to better know each other and ourselves through this analog, engaged act of keeping score, of marking a year. And so I ask the audience to look inward and acquaint yourself with your secret anorak. And remember that this small, imperfect data we all collect is a way of continually engaging with ourselves and the world around us, and shouldn't be ignored, but offers immense value in how it helps us stay in the game of our lives. Thank you.